Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is my privilege to speak to you tonight uh, about the sanctuary message. The sanctuary message is one of my favorites. I've been studying and I've been meditating upon this uh, message for many years. I have been working as an evangelist for many years. I, sh I, I should say many years because I have white hair <laughs> like this. It's a blessing. Thank you, brother. And uh, through my mistakes and through my stumblings and through my success, I've learned that sanctuary is not only a theory, but also we have to take it in as Christian walk and experience daily. So sanctuary is the only way that we can understand about true gospel. You see, as he said, the sanctuary, the way of God is where? In the sanctuary, Psalm 77, verse 13. So this has been my conviction that we have to emphasize this message over and over and over and over. But sad to say that as a people of the word of God, we have forgotten about this message so many different occasions and years of our past. So everywhere that I try to go and preach or share the gospel, I try to assimilate this sanctuary message uh, in my talk. And uh, I'm glad that uh, the general title of this message is, of course, the narrow way, but the focused on the sanctuary message. By the way, I would like to encourage you to go out there uh, at, at the, uh, near to the entrance that uh, you will have a sign-up sheets. And if you sign up uh, your name and addresses, then we're going to send you uh, monthly our re news report, what is taking place by the miracles of God in the biggest field in the world, China. And then you're going to receive my monthly sermon CD or DVD. So I, I uh, would, would like to er, um, ask you if you have a time to go out there after the meeting to, have find, uh, to find a time to sign up your name there, and uh, you'll be blessed. Tonight I'm going to share with you one of the very practical lessons of the sanctuary. And this practical lesson is called, of course, the sanctuary, but I should call it building on Jesus. The way of God is in the sanctuary. Sanctuary can be very dry and theoretic, especially young people can become bored to death. But at the same time, if we emphasize and try to understand properly, the sanctuary message is the most exciting message. As a matter of fact, the reason you and I are Seventh-day Adventists is because of this message, the sanctuary message. We did not become Adventists because of the teachings of the Sabbath truth. Of course, the Sabbath truth is one of the vital messages, one of our foundations. But that message is not the message that made you and I as the remnant people at the end. You see, the state of death, all the, you know, exposing the errors of the eternal hellfire doctrines or others or health messages, they are good foundations of our messages. And yet, those messages are not the messages that made you and I to exist as Seventh-day Adventist. And I challenge you, it is the sanctuary message that made you and I the specific remnant of the woman at the end of earth history. So we have to understand this, not only understand it theoretically, but we have to experience it. We have to walk in it. We have to walk by it. Because there's a, only one way that can explain to you and I, for the eternal gospel is through the sanctuary message. You see, there are three ways. Number one, courtyard way. Number two, sanctuary way. Number three, the most holy place way. 
God gave you and I the message that how we can become prepared to live eternally with holy angels and holy God. There's only one way, and as you say, and that is the sanctuary way. Sanctuary way. Let's begin. Now, tonight I'm going to share with you about very basic things, and I'd like to start with the quotation from the Great Controversy, page 622. And I want to read the first sentence. The time of trouble, such as never was, is soon to open upon us. Would you agree with me? Yes. yes. And next sentence. And we shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent to obtain. Would you say amen to this? Amen. Yes. Let's move on. In that time of trial, Every soul must stand for himself before God. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the land, as I leave, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. What would you say? Amen. I amen to this wholeheartedly. Let's go on. Next paragraph. And it says, Now... While our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become what? Perfect in Christ. Would you say amen to this? Amen. It says we should become perfect in Christ, not in nature, but in character. All right? And it says, not even by a thought. Could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation? Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. And then next sentence says, He had kept his father's con commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. What would you say? Amen. Now, if we stop here, it will not give us that much impact, because we already know this. As a matter of fact, most of Christians out there, even in the Babylonian church realms, understand and believe this. But we, Seventh-day Adventists, have the last sentence, and it says, this is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of what? Trouble. Trouble. What would you say? Amen. Do you really believe this? If you do, we better do something about this, don't we? We have to do something in order to prepare a specific experience, and that is to stand before God without the mediator. In our character, when the close of probation occurs, Satan should not be able to find any foothold within your souls and in mine as well. And I'm fearful about this. Sometimes I'm trem trembling. I know God is love and He's merciful. He's so sympathetic with you and I. But sometimes when I think about this, I'm trembling before God. Not because I'm scared of the judgment, but because we have tremendous responsibility at the end of earth history. My friends, God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church to make them as final witnesses in the history of mankind. We are not just here to live, to be barely saved, my friend. Wake up, my brothers and sisters. We are here and living at this time in order to become the final witnesses. Without you and I, who understand the faith of Jesus Christ and keep the commandments of God. Without us, God cannot finish the history of sin. God has to manifest the last kind of the remnant people. There has been remnant people throughout the earth history in a way, 
Abel was remnant, was he not? Noah was rem remnant, was he not? Oh, yes. Joseph was remnant, and John the Baptist was remnant, and Ruther was remnant. And yet, Jesus Christ is trying to raise up the specific last final remnant of woman at the end of earth history. Friends, I have to tell you early on, when I go there and meet some sacrificial and devout Christians, especially Seventh-day Adventists in China, and I asked some of my staff members to come down to Hong Kong. I met them a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact. And I sat with them, and that these people, some, some of them had a first experience coming away from their own country, China. This first experience going out to the overseas or, 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 or foreign country. But you know what? They do not have any any anxiousness or any desire to have sightseeings. And I told them that, that uh, don't you want to go around and see some Hong Kong? I say, Pastor Kong, we are here to speak with you, to hear and learn from you, to have discussions and plans of our work. We have no desire to go around because we are going to go to heaven. And, and, and one of them told me that, uh, Pastor Kong, we are going to enjoy eternal vacation up in he heaven, and that's what you are waiting for. And I hope and wish that uh, you can see them through my eyes, their tears, their dedications, their prayers, their art and work. When I come back to this Western Hemisphere, I'm sorry to tell you that I see and feel the churches are dead dead spiritually. Friends, I'm glad that you're here to hear these messages. But you have to understand that somewhere in the different parts of the world, God is working. If your church is dead in evangelism, you feel that God is dead sometimes. That's how you feel. But God is alive. And He's finishing His work. And he has his witnesses in different parts of the world. And some of our, church, our staff members now in prison, right now today. And some of them, they are spreading their books. I'll show you some pictures uh, uh, in this presentation. They're spreading their books on the street corners. When they see police coming, they just wrap them up. They run. Sometimes they're confiscated or put them in jail or interrogated. But they don't care. Because they are looking for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters, it's time to wake up. Amen. Time to wake up. Now, if this quotation we just read from Great Controversy is the truth, then we must do something about this, don't we? Okay? Now, as I told you, one made us the Seventh-day Adventist, and it's the sanctuary message. This is not only the message, this is the our personal experiences should be. When our forefathers began to realize, understand that Jesus Christ just walked into the most holy place and they began to ask this question, what does it mean to us? What does it mean to me personally? Now Jesus Christ is cleansing the sanctuary. What does it mean for me? We have to ask the same question that will make you and I true remnant of the woman at the end. Now, what is the final destination of the sanctuary? Of course, the most holy place. If we are living in the era of the most holy place, then what does it mean? When Jesus Christ is blotting out of sin or He's cleansing the record of the heavenly books, then what does it mean to you and I? Jesus Christ can never cleanse or blot out sins unless we in our, in our soul sanctuary, have experience of blotting out of sin. There's two different things. The forget, forgiveness of sin and blotting out of sin. Right? Mostly, include many Adventists, they only emphasize about the aspect of forgiveness. Friends, we are living 
in the time that we must understand what it means about the blotting out of sin. Unless you and I give up all our sinful ways or habits or all our idols by the grace of God, we know that by our experiences we cannot do that. Our self is so strong. Our sinful memories are so strong in our brain, hypothalamus specifically. And we all know that by experiences. Only through the grace of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit within our souls, we are able to overcome. One time, I spoke in one of, one of the camp meetings like this, and I asked this question and about overcoming, and the one lady after the meeting and came up to me, and she said, she said that, uh, Pastor Kang, now I know the problem. It's a chocolate. That's exactly what she told me. Chocolate. You may say, I, this is ridiculous, but we all cut out to be different. Our temptations are different. Our characteristics are different. You see? So what is your problem? My brothers and my sisters, tonight, I'm talking to you individually tonight. What is your problem? I'm an evangelist with the Word of God. My job is to convince you and persuade you with the, with the Word of God so that you can come to the throne of grace and surrender. That's my job. And I gave my life for it. I've been working for that direction in the last many years. Of course, I made some mistakes sometimes when I think about that, uh, especially uh, when I baptize some souls without true preparations in the past. I still, you know, say sorry to my Lord. But that's my job, to convict you and convince you with the Word of God. Let me ask you again, my friends, what is the thing? My young people, old, young, middle-aged, doesn't matter. What is your problem in your soul tonight? What is the stumbling block? What stops you to bring all of you to the throne of God, to the altar of the burnt offering, and give you up? And you know what I'm talking about. Maybe your some thoughts, maybe books, music, your selfishness. You don't give up certain wealth of your life, and you know that. What is it? Now, if you just brush away of my challenging questions tonight, I'll tell you, you have a problem with Jesus Christ. It's about time. I don't want to live in this kind of world so long. I want my Jesus to come soon. What about you? Amen. I want my Jesus to come soon. You see, the most holy place. You see, we need to think about this time to time. Now, what is taking place in the most holy place? Okay, let us read Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30 and 31 and 33. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from how many sins? All your sins before the Lord. All your sins. Do you believe it? From all our sins. How can we be cleansed from all our sins? By the power of the gospel. That's why Jesus Christ came to this world to free us from all sins and their powers. Sin is a power. The grace of God is a power, but sin is power as well. Let's move on. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and it shall afflict your souls by a statue forever. What does it mean, afflict ourselves? Searching of our hearts, even though it hurts. Even if it hurts. And he shall make what? An atonement. Tyndale made this English word because he could not find the sort of a proper word. So atonement, as we all know, is at one month. By the way, English is my second language. I still have a problem with English sometimes. Sometimes I cannot really think of the proper uh, vocabularies or idioms or in, in some good uh, expressions. I wish 
I could speak f as fluently as some of the speakers who are here in these meetings. And I, if I have a command of English, I think I can become much more powerful in presenting God's Word. You know, when I present messages like this in English, I have to think about that. I have to sometimes phrase it. I have to practice it. Sometimes when I practice, as I was taking a shower, my wife's open door and say, Honey, what are you doing? Sometimes. <laughs> Believe me, trust me. It's difficult sometimes to, to, to preach in, in the foreign language. I was born and raised in Korea. So I have to pray a lot when I preach in English. I mean that. You see, so make an atonement means at one month with God. We fell. We are separated from God because of our sins. Unless we resolve the problem of sin, we cannot be reunited. But I have to tell you this. I do not believe the old doctrines, all the, all the lights and truth, that, the present truth that you and I understand and share cannot become the criteria or the standards for everyone for 6,000 years. Why do I believe that? What about those people who used to live in the 1,000 years ago or 100 years ago, 300 years ago, who never understood about the Sabbath truth, never understood about the health, uh, health reform, never understood uh, or heard about uh, the spirit prophecy? What about that? God, merciful, our merciful God will not apply the same rule of measure with those people. Then, I should say comfortably that this present truth are basically for the salvation of humankind. But this present truth that you and I understand is to produce the final witnesses so that Jesus Christ can come soon. Would you agree? Yeah. We're talking about very serious matter here. So we must understand what it means to be cleansed from all our sins by the grace of God. Now, and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation. Oh, he is going to cleanse not only the human beings, not God's people, but the his holy sanctuary tabernacle as well because our sins contaminated our sin defiled the heavenly sanctuary because our sins are recorded in heaven that's why unto 2300 days the sanctuary shall be what Amen. cleansed cleansed so when god cleanses his sanctuary and up in heaven he has to cleanse our soul as well from all our defilement of the sin And for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priest, all priests as well, and for all the people of the congregation. When God purifies his church, the church is going to be purified, spotless. And I believe it. And I believe it. Even though I don't see it, I believe it according to the promise of God. What are you? I believe it. God is going to purify is remnant church, and no doubt. All right, now, 1 John chapter 3, verse 6 to 9. By the way, many years ago, as a pastor, I hated, I hated chapter 3 of 1 John. I wanted to take it out. Why, why did John write this? I didn't like it. I have never preached. Uh, I had, I, not, not I have, I had never preached at that time. I didn't like it, like it, because that was impossible to me. Now, 1 John chapter 3, verse 6 to 9 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. By the way, I'm going to ask you this question. What is abiding in Jesus Christ? Jesus abide in us and we abide in him. Jesus abide in me and I abide in him. Or I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior or Master or King or Lord. What does it mean to you? Does it mean that we accept his teachings? Does it mean that Jesus uh, Christ died on the cross for our sins? We accept the truth? What does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus Christ abides in you and I, and we abide in Jesus Christ? It's very simple. If you read the desire of ages, when Jesus Christ was talking about the relations between the vine and the branches, it's very simple. 
Sometimes we forget about the inspired word of God by the prophet, by a, not, the, not a prophet. That's why sometimes we don't understand the meaning. It's simply, one day I was reading, I'm a pastor all day, and pastor and evangelist, but one day I was reading, I said, wait a minute, this is a simple reason of, of abiding in Jesus and Jesus abiding in me? You know, I was, I was really waking up to the truth. What it means is this, simply, when Jesus says something and I say, yes, Lord, I believe it, I understand it, and I will obey it. And I surrender before him. That's how, we, how I am going into Jesus. And Jesus said, okay, if you do that, I will make you a peculiar people of mine, and then I'm going to fulfill my promise in your life. So, Abiding in Jesus simply means give and take. Give and take. We give our sins, our spirit of rebellion. We give all that I am, all that we are to Jesus Christ. We give, and then Jesus accepts. When we give, we begin to abide in Jesus. That's obedience. That's why the, one of the characteristics of remnant people is keeping God's commandments. And then Jesus gives himself to us and says, I will become your God in your life. And then he begins to abide in us. Isn't that simple? That's what the spirit prophecy defines. So it says what? Whosoever sinneth not, uh, sinneth, has not seen him, neither know him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is, not of, the, is, is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Now, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, which means Jesus Christ came to destroy the power of sin, the works of the devil in, within you and within me. And I tell you, with the trembling of my heart, and I'll tell you, my brothers and sisters, because if you are convicted and join us, join me, then we are hastening, hastening Jesus coming tonight. That's why I'm telling you with all my heart, if we, if we understand that Jesus Christ can destroy the works of evil now, today, within our hearts, that's what John was talking about. Jesus came not to die on the cross alone, but make you and I stop sinning that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remains in him. What is the seed of God? That's the word of God, truth, isn't it? And then that's the Holy Spirit and his grace, isn't it? So if the seed of God remains in you and I, as long as we have the truth, accepted as long as we surrender before God, as long as we abide in Jesus Christ, we do not need to sin. That's what it means. And then, and he, what? Cannot, cannot sin. This was the reason I didn't like this. And I, and I thought that why, why someone put this word in the Bible? I could understand. I didn't like it. But when I began to understand that, by Lord's grace, I began to cry. I began to give my heart to Jesus like I had never have done in the past. At that time, I believe through the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ really, really came into my heart as my Savior. The Savior and Lord who can control and who can overrule of all my wickedness and evilness within my soul, Jesus began to come into my heart. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, 
Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay, come in to my heart, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. He is our Savior. You see, I'll tell you something. I do not sin against my wife. It's impossibility. So I can say safely, I cannot sin against my wife. Why? Because I love her. Even though you want to kill me, I'm not going to sin against my wife. I cannot lay with another woman in the hotel. I just cannot do that. I, it doesn't, not I don't do it, but I cannot do it. Steal any money and lie against my wife? I, not, I don't do it, but I cannot do it. Trust me. You go and ask my wife, and she will testify that. <laughs> I cannot do it. To my children? Not I don't sin against them, but I cannot sin because I love them more than my life. And you parents, you understand what I'm talking about. How can I sin against my children? How can I take advantage out of them? I cannot. I would like to give my own life for, for them if it's necessary. That's what he's talking about. If we are in Jesus and Jesus abides in us and we become one, we cannot sin. But sometimes we are out of that relationship. That's why we fall and make mistakes and we sin. All right. Now, time is really running, so we have to move up. The blotting out of sin, I already, already explained to you. Okay? The God gave us the sanctuary so that we can understand how God is going to save us from sin. Okay? So this is, this is the living illustration so that God's people can understand as they were giving offerings and going through all these uh, procedures, they will understand how God saved us from our own sin problem. The problem of sin. That's more proper English, isn't it? So when I said a sin problem, they say, someone came to me and said, no, Pastor Kang, it's a problem of sin, not sin problem. So I, 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 you know, I learned it. Okay? So in, in, the, in the courtyard, it's talking about the altar of the burnt offering. We're talking about our dedications and total surrendering before God. Okay? So we need to be burned. as a burned sacrifice. Everything's unto the God. Then it becomes a sweet fragrance unto the Lord. All right? And then we understand about the uh, labor. Sometimes it's called in the Bible sea, the water container. But you know what? Okay? Nowadays... Nowadays, we have a problem. Okay, there must be what? Well, let me move. move. There must be the, the bur ultra burnt offering first, which means we must surrender everything unto the Lord. We cannot do that unless we truly understand the meaning of the cross of Jesus Christ. Why he has given everything on the altar for us. When we understand that, we, in response, we want to give everything to Jesus Christ. It cannot be coerced. It's supposed to be voluntary. So we have to have burnt offering experience. And then we are going to be cleansed, baptism or cleansing experience. And then we are going to move into the holy place. But you know what? Nowadays, they are reversed. Sometimes they say, oh, just bring people in. Just baptize them. Uh, you know, make a dry devils to wet devils. That's what some English <laughs> preachers are saying that. And I have learned that from them. I, I didn't invent them. Some preachers are saying that, you know, making uh, wet devils from dry devils. Okay, that, that, I, th I think that's a, a good uh, illustrations or, or expressions. Well, anyway, they said, bring them in, and then we'll teach them and help them to have a surrendering experience. It cannot be done, my friends. We have to convict people with the truth, so and then we introduce them to cross and Jesus Christ so that they willingly, they give themselves up for Jesus Christ, and then they can be baptized or they can be cleansed. And sometimes these burnt offering, ultra burnt offering is entirely eliminated. They're just talking about labor, baptisms. That's a danger. That's not Adventist message, my friends. Okay, let's move on. So, so we, we understand this. Uh, in the holy place, but we are going into the most holy place where the Shekinah glory resides. 
okay? Quickly, okay? Two parts of the sanctuary structure. First part is the courtyard. The center is the altar of the uh, you know, burnt offering. But the, the second part where the sanctuary and the most holy place is, holy place, holy place, and the most holy place is, uh, did I say sanctuary and the, whole, the most holy place? No, it's a holy place and the most holy place is. The center focus is the Ark of Covenant, where God's Ten Commandments are. So in first part, God designed so that we will have true repentance experience, so that we are going to keep the commandments of God truly, perfectly by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, the salvation has to do with a hatred of sin and the love of righteousness. So, when we give animal offering to God, through killing of the animal, what we do, we learn our hard-headed hard -headed people, we learn of God's love. You see, why we have sinned, but why in the world someone else died for us? especially Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Why? And through killing the animal, God is knocking at hardened minds such as yours and mine. So through the sanctuary, sanctuary service, we learned what? It everlasting gospel. How can we approach to God? First of all, we have to learn of God's love first. Without that, nothing works. Nothing works. We have to learn that first. Okay? The first record of the gospel in the Bible, Genesis 3, 15, talking about, I will put what? Enmity between thee and the woman. What is the enmity? Enmity is a hatred, isn't it? Okay, what is the enmity? The hatred of what? Great controversy, page 505. Sister White said, it is the grace that Christ, do what? Implants in the soul, which creates in, in man, enmity, hatred against sin and Satan originator. The power which Christ imparts enables man to resist the tyrant and usurper when you and I understand how God loves us. Without that understanding, you see, sometimes God is leading you through perils and temptations and trials or death or having having. Uh, cancer, or AIDS, no matter what, it, what that is, or poverty, losing all your money. You lo you, you, let's suppose, suppose you lost $3 million. Praise God that you lost $3 million. God is helping you to go through so that you will, all your focus are on Jesus Christ. This, you know, what devil is doing is it distracts you by many different things, not only money, many different things, so that you will not focus on Jesus entirely. Do you understand that? So when we understand Jesus Christ and His love, then everything will come in place. We are willing to give ourselves to Jesus and receive Holy Spirit. Who, who the power which Christ imparts enables man to resist the tyrant and usurper. Who ever is seen to abhor sin instead of loving it. Whoever resists and conquers those passions that have held sway within displays the operation of a principle holy from above. I have some stories to tell you, but I have to omit because, it, you know, it's the time clock is telling me that, you know, it's a countdown clocks. Sometimes this is a bomb. You know, I mean, please, I have to see that, brother. Thank you for your thought, but I have to see that. Okay, these are ages. Page 597 says, okay, Christ is a tried stone. Those who trust in him, he never disappoints. He has borne everyone. Test. He has endured the pressure of Adam's guilt and the guilt of his uh, posterity and has come of more than conqueror of the powers of evil. He has borne the burdens cast upon him by every repenting sinner. Now, Jesus Christ is the foundation cornerstone, isn't it? He's a, he's a, he's a foundation stone, the cornerstone. Now, Jesus said in the Gospels, that he is a cornerstone, the stone of foundations. He was cast and was not paid attentions by these builders. They've been searching, searching for a certain stone. 
cut out to be right, to be placed in the corner, so that all these huge stones can press down. Press down still can resist and hold those pressures. Jesus Christ came down, and He got all these pressures of the power of evils and sins of yours and mine. Upon Him, He endured. He became a Savior. And he went through. Why did Jesus Christ go into the wombs of Mary? And then he came out with this tiny cell. He began with the tiny cell. Why? Why did he become the tiny cell? And then he grew up for nine months as he was coming out. He came out like this. Why? Have you, have you ever asked that question to yourself? Why did he do that? So that he will prove the point that he could bear all this power and pressures of sin. Sometimes you and I think that it is impossible for me to, to overcome. But Jesus Christ, He went through exactly of the procedures or life of you and I, I go through. So that He shows now, I could do it. If you receive my Holy Spirit, you can do it to my friend. You can do, do it, my son, my daughters. Jesus Christ is truly tested stone. So why do I label this message the building on Jesus. This sanctuary is talking about your experience, my brother, your experience, my sister, your experience, my young person, your experience, my, my, my friends. It is talking about my experience, that sanctuary message. It's not only theory, but it is telling us that gee, we can build on Jesus, the experience of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. The faith that Jesus Christ had in this world while he was living. Do you believe that? We can have that faith, which means sanctuary is our building. Jesus is the stone. Apostle Peter said, we are living stones as well. We are being built as a house of God. Jesus Christ built the sanctuary in his life. So, so can you, so can I. Building on Jesus, if Jesus Christ could, you and I can as well. And I believe it by the promise of God. What about you? Amen. I believe it. And I believe it. Okay. Uh, he, uh, uh, testimony, volume three, 380. He has shown them how they may overcome on their own account as he overcame. Okay, let's move on. We don't have much time. Does the sanctuary message become the foundation for our experiences? Are we building our experiences on Jesus? Our example. Are you building your experiences on Jesus? It's a very, very serious question, isn't it? Don't you ever forget that until Jesus Christ comes. Are you building your Christian experience on Jesus like Jesus had lived? That's the purpose why he came to destroy the works of the evil within your souls and mine. I pray to God the Lord will perform that miracle in me daily. I know I'm so weak. I know there's an evil in me. That's what the Bible says. We have a sinful nature. But by the grace of God, as I surrender, may the Holy Spirit build that sanctuary within my soul. Within my soul. Okay, I have to omit some, some, some things. 144,000. No one in the universe, including angels, will be ever able to excuse his or her sin or a spirit of rebellion after the demonstration of 144,000. I'm going to have to skip some of the uh, things and then move on. Okay, these are the pictures I'm going to show you. These Sunday church pastors come to our seminar, Life of Life seminars. I'm purely talking about three angels' messages. Everlasting gospel. In my presentation, one year, uh, one year, last year, three pastors stood up and they said, Pastor Kang, you know what? What you're preaching as far as the gospel is concerned is right. That's correct. That's biblical. We have been preaching this new theology, garbage gospels, gospels all these times, and then we have seen the result. Our church corrupt, so liberalized. We don't want that anymore. We want the true biblical gospel. Do you know why I, I, I'm telling you these things? Because God, I see through my eyes right now. I've been working as an evangelist for many years in the past. Believe me and trust me on that. But nowadays, 
the Lord has opened my eyes, and I began to see pastors and laity in Babylonian churches prepared to come out. They're prepared, my friends. They want to come out. They're searching for the true church that can reflect the image of Jesus Christ, my friends. This is the truth. When I meet these pastors and lay people, sometimes I cry. What can I do, Lord? How many churches are ready to accept this, this kind of people? It makes me cry. Really. You see, these, I mean, beautiful, beautiful church leaders that I meet. I'm not, I'm not, you know, making any exaggerations. These things are taking place in different parts of the world by God's grace, my friends. You think sometimes God is dead. No, He's not dead. He's living, alive, powerful. He's doing his work, Be, being pressured. Let's, let's, let's move on. Okay, I'm going to show you some pictures of our literature evangelists in China. They spread books on the street corners like this, and they give out or sell people. Chinese people, they love to read. They love books. You see, as they pass by, they, they buy these books, especially when they, when they spread before the entrance of Sunday churches on Sunday. They sell books. Or they give out books to many pastors as well. They, they, they really want to, want to come and grab those books. Now, this sister, you see, there's heavy books on his back. Uh, how do you say it? Back sack? Backpack. Backpack, thank you. Back, I told you this English is my second language. Backpack with, with the only thing is, 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 a, is a books and the water. And they're just going, going through the marketplaces and they sell those books. Sometimes they, they go to jail, but they don't care. Look at this, these people. You see, when I see these people, you know, recently we have five book storage houses in China. And um, uh, recently one of our book storage, book storage houses was, was uh, captured or arrested. And the police came and they confiscated all our books and all, all our financial financial. Account. Uh, what do you call it? That uh, record. the record, record, and then took three sisters into 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 police station for interrogations. One of them, she was carrying those heavy books on her shoulders, and uh, she has a shoulder spasm and problems, and she has been walking uh, a lot between the uh, the storage house and the post office so so many times, and she has a problem on her, one of her legs, and she could not walk well. And another sister was divorced by her husband because she was so ardent and devout Christian worker, and spreading these books all over China. And she was divorced. And uh, her husband and then, and then her son said that, uh, do you love Jesus more than us? I said, no, we, we love you. I love you very, very much. But I must do this. This is a call from my, my God, my creator. And another sister was 20 years old, young girl. They all went, went to jail. And then this police, uh, police began to search all this financial record. And they say, they even record small few cents, like in, in American money, my 15 cents or, or quarter of the selling of the garbage, just some, some uh, you know, the boxes, you know, empty boxes. And they're so faithful, and they say, wait a minute, these people began, they people, they printed and then, uh, and then promoted illegal books, and yeah, they're such a Christians. Beautiful Christians. We have never met this kind of beautiful Christians. So what should we do? Can we, even though they, uh, they broke our law, can we put them in jail, this kind of good citizens? They were debating, and then they said, okay, we'll let you go. <laughs> and then they gave our monies back too, you saw, uh, in the balance of the, of the bank. As these three sisters coming away, and they said, with boldness, you need a faith and boldness to ask these questions. Well, sir, detectives, can you give those books back to us? Unless you have Jesus Christ as your stone, tested stone in your life, you cannot ask those questions before the detectives tips in the communist country like China. You cannot do that. That's, you think you can do it. It takes experience, my friends. And she said, they said, uh, give us our book back. They laughed at them and said, 
we release you, and even we gave you money back, but you are asking us to give you book bags? Are you out of your minds? And they said, yes, we are out of our minds, but we need to have them. That's our work. Finally, after a few days, they gave all our books back. <laughs> Friends, this is all I'm saying tonight. If there's anyone who hasn't given up his or her life for Jesus, even though you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross and gave up everything for your eternal life, while you're knowing it, you have never really felt it. You have never really given yourself on the altar. You don't know Christ personally. My friends, I'm an evangelist of Jesus, of gospel, his gospel. Please come to Jesus. Please come to the cross and kneel and say, Lord, tonight I accept you as my Savior. I accept you from now on as my Lord. I hope this message will bring some influence of the Spirit of God that you will make a right decision tonight. May God bless you.